thankful to be here tonight. I'm so thankful to be here at Word Alive Fellowship. Thank you, Father, for congregating us tonight on our Sunday evening service in Lake Worth, Florida. And, and I'm Pastor Bob, but if you'd like to contact me, you can call me at area code 561-331-7533. And I have been doing some meditation in the Book of Acts, and I've been doing it on Sunday nights. And we've been going through Acts chapter 6 all the way through chapter 17 that, that we completed recently, but in meditating on Acts chapter 18, I'm just going to begin with verse 1. Now we're looking at the book of Acts, chapter 18, and verse 1 lets us know that the Apostle Paul left Athens, where he had ministered in the previous chapter. So, in 1 Corinthians 18, 1, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. When he got to Corinth, he met a Jewish man named Aquila. He is a guy that was born in the region of Pontus. He had recently come from Italy to Corinth, accompanied by his wife Priscilla. And the reason that he and his wife Priscilla had recently come from Italy is because the emperor of Rome had ordered all the Jews that live in Rome to leave. So that's why Aquila and his wife Priscilla left Rome. But when they got to Corinth, Paul met Aquila and he went to visit he and his wife so he went to see them and found out that they were tent makers, just as Paul was a tent maker. So he stayed in Corinth, because he had a way to get some income, you know, stay a while in Corinth while he did ministry. And he worked with Aquila and Priscilla making tents. But when we get to verse 4, ministry is taking place, even though he's doing tent making, ministry is taking place because in verse 4 every Sabbath Paul went into the synagogue in Corinth and, and he reasoned with the people there in the synagogue trying to persuade both Jews and Greeks to believe that Jesus is the Messiah so that I just continue to go through this because verse 5 would, would come in with this additional thought that that Paul's buddies Silas and Timothy helpers in the ministry Silas and Timothy when they came to Corinth having previously ministered in Macedonia the northern region of Greece you know Corinth is in the southern region of Greece so Silas and Timothy had been ministering in the northern part of Greece. So when they came south and joined Paul down in southern Greece in Corinth, it was time for Paul, according to Acts 18.5, to devote himself exclusively to preaching. Mm. You know, testifying to the Jews that right. Jesus is the Messiah. But, but he exclusively he exclusively devoted himself to that preaching once his buddies had joined him in, in the missionary work in Corinth. I mean, Silas and Timothy, they've been in northern Greece, now they get down to southern Greece, join him in Corinth, and now Paul's really free to do what he's really anointed to do. He's going. got his helpers here, you know, so going. now he can really focus on, on preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. But what happened is, in verse 6, that when Jewish people opposed Paul and when they were abusive to him, then Paul, he reacted in such a way as shaking his clothes, as if to shake the dust off his clothes. You know, reminiscent of Jesus saying, shake the dust off your feet. Well, he's shaking the dust off his clothes, you know. You know and, and he's saying to them, 
you know, you guys are responsible for the fact that I let you know the message. Now, what happens is between you and God. You know, the way he expressed it is, your blood's on your own head, a Jewish expression. You know, your blood's on your own head. You're, you're responsible for what happens, you know? Because I'm clear of my responsibility, says the old NIV. Sounds like Pilate. Yeah, I'm clear of my... Sounds like Pilate. It's exactly like Pilate. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I'm going to go to the nations. Well, what happened is, in verse 7, that Paul moved into the house next door to the synagogue. Because there's a guy in the house who's a worshiper of God, whose name is Titius Justice. So he is going to be his host while he's in Corinth. Okay? But in verse 8, Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed him in his testimony about Jesus and got baptized. And, and Ron, you were involved in getting baptized yesterday, right? Yeah, Nathan, myself, and Chris. That's cool. You got baptized? Just yesterday? Again. Yeah, so it just caught my attention when I was reading it about many of the Corinthians. They heard Paul and believed him and were baptized, and it made me think of yesterday we had three friends get baptized. So, it's pretty powerful, too. Amen. So, when you get to verse 9, this is Acts 18, when you get to verse 9, this is something of the Lord communicating to Paul in a very personal way. Why do I say that? Because. He, because one night, according to verse 9, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul. So he's hearing him speak out loud. That's very personal to me. When you hear the Lord speaking out loud, you okay? But in verse 9, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. So he's not only hearing him audibly, he's actually seeing the image of the person who is speaking to him. Right? So, in verse 9, one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. And he says to him, don't be afraid, keep on speaking, don't be silent. That's what he said to you. Amen. He said to me, don't be afraid too. Personally. Nearly 48 years ago, he said to me, don't be afraid, relax. Because I was trembling with fear when he spoke to me, right? And so what does he say to Paul here? Amen. Don't be afraid, keep on speaking, don't be silent. For I am with you. That's verse 10. For I am with you. I'm just stuck on that phrase right yeah, there. Right and, <laughs> and for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many that are on my team in this city of Corinth. Yeah. 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 And then verse 11, so Paul spent a year and a half there in Corinth, teaching them the Word of God. And this reminds me of the fact that when Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, which is a letter he wrote later, you know, writing the letter to the brothers and sisters in Corinth that were part of the Messianic community, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, that while he was in Corinth among the people, he only preached one subject. Jesus, the anointed king, and the fact that the scripture said that he had to die. So he just focused on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah because he's the one that died and came back to life. So in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, while he was among them in Corinth, then he just devoted himself to the one subject, Jesus, the anointed king, and him crucified, which takes me back to Acts 18.11. So Paul stayed there in Corinth for a year and a half teaching the Lord of God. So he's teaching about the cross in relationship to the Messiah for a year and a half. He's hanging out on the cross 
in terms of teaching for a year and a half. Because he says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, just another 1 Corinthians line in a letter that was written later on to the same Corinthian audience whom he met when he was there in person in Corinth. But in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the teaching of the cross is the power of God for those who are being saved from death. But those who are in the process of dying, that message is silliness to them. The Messiah being crucified. That's silly to these people that are dying. But to the people that are being saved from dying, the teaching of the cross is the power of God. Experience. Because, because of teaching of the cross is a revelation mm -hmm. of the fact that when the Messiah died, everything about our behavior that our human conscience is displeased with in the mind of God died on that cross. Blessings to you all. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. We're just going to uh, Mark Mark De Lorenzo's got a got a quick question. But he's in Corinth eighteen months. There is no New Testament, and he's teaching. Uh, he's preaching to the Jew, to Gentiles about Jesus the Messiah. Yes. Ah, this is going to sound silly. This is the silliest question. What can he even preach it? For eighteen months in the Old Testament, I, mean, I know there's a lot of scriptures we see in Matthew that are quotes. Maybe there's so much more there that I don't see. Exactly. Oh, you know what I'm yes. Absolutely. He's just preaching from that book. A Absolutely. None of the, That's it. None of the Hellenists were just the scriptures. That's it. He's just preaching. That's it. The test. The, 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 there is that much there. I wish I knew more of it. Well, you will. You're going to be seeing it. Right. You're going to be seeing it more and more. And he wrote in the Second Thessalonians letter. Excuse me. I meant to say Second Corinthians. So I'll return to the. 2 Corinthians, but in chapter 3, he talks about in verse 14, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, he talks about the people that are reading the teachings of Moses are, like some of them are made dull, right, and they don't really see the Messiah in the teachings of Moses, right? Their minds were made dull. For to this day, it's like a veil covers their heart and everything. Right. But 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 when 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 somebody turns to the Lord as the teacher of the Scripture, like the personal teacher, you know, when they turn to the Lord, all of a sudden the veil is taken away, and now they can see what's in the text about the Messiah. And so this is clearly what happened to the Apostle Paul that when he was on the road to Damascus as a person that was on his way to arrest people that believe in Jesus, all of a sudden the Lord arrests him with his presence and he's just like in the presence of Jesus, the, the light of heaven is shining down from the sky on him and he falls to the ground and he hears the audible voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm the guy you're persecuting, named Jesus. Then all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul, after the experience of meeting Jesus, is able to read the teachings of Moses, and he's seeing the Messiah all over the law of Moses. And I began to experience a little taste of that when I was going through the law of Moses in my journey through the Bible in the last two and a half years. I mean, I, I, I'm just, I never saw so much in, in the Law of Moses. I ne never saw so much in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, yeah, okay. you know, and Deuteronomy. I mean, I just, I, when I got to Deuteronomy, I had to hang out for months yeah. just on, on a certain number of chapters well. because, because it was so much there, you know? Just, just like, this is deep stuff, you know? Yeah. But, but when I tried to read through those chapters for years in my past, I didn't see this stuff. I mean, it went past me, or I just missed it. 
But, but God progressively opens our eyes in answer to our prayers. You know, the Ephesians 1.18 prayer, to enlighten the eyes of our hearts so we can see. I think he gives you a different focus. He gives you a different focus. Instead of focus on the seeing part. There, there is a different focus. There's a focus. And so, so there's more verses than just or insight than like, you know, the Rama verse where the children be crying. Like, oh, you know when you read Matthew and these oh, quotes? Yeah. So there's, there's even more than that. Yes. The, the hidden gems that are... In the it, absolutely. Oh, okay. And that's what Colossians 2 verse 3 is referring to. That's what Colossians 2 verse 3 is referring to. That in the Messiah, and it's at a time when the scripture is Jesus' Jewish scripture, that's the only Bible at the time, that Colossians chapter 2, verse 3 is written. Right. In the Messiah are hidden all the treasures of biblical wisdom and knowledge. Yes. It's hidden. So it's revealed in the Spirit. Kind of like your 1 Corinthians 2.10. Because remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, the Spirit searches all things even searches the deep things of God. And the cross is deep when the Spirit is revealing to you everything about the priesthood of the law of Moses is about the cross. I mean, everything about the priesthood, everything about the Day of Atonement, you know, it's all a revelation. Because remember, Jesus is the high priest. And he offered himself as the sacrifice. He's the lamb as the sacrifice, but he's also the high priest that makes the offering of himself to the Father. And then God accepts the offering by raising from the dead people and declaring that all humanity is forgiven of every sin, past, present, and future. So when you go back to the Acts 18 and you are reminded of Acts 18.11. So Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth teaching them the word of God. When you get to verse 12, Acts 18, verse 12, there's a guy named Gallio. And, and the NIV says he's proconsul. And, and I read a children's Bible before service that said that he's the governor. And I'm going to go with governor. Okay? And... The region that he's governing is the southern Greece region, and it's called Achaia. But Achaia simply means like the region of southern Greece, right? So I'll just put it in my own translation to say in Acts 18, verse 12. When Gallio was governor of the southern Greece region called Achaia, The Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul. And they brought him to the place of judgment. They charged the governor, whose name is Gallio. They charged him in verse 13. This is Acts 18, verse 13. They charged him, this man Paul is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Because remember what he was doing in Acts 18, verse 4. He was every Sabbath going into the reason in the synagogue, you know, discuss the scriptures in the synagogue with the people there, trying to persuade him about Jesus, right? Well, now Gallio, the governor of southern Greece, Achaia, he realizes, even as a secular guy, that there's an impact through Apostle Paul's ministry because he could... He could see that people are, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm beginning to talk about what Gallio says in a little speech that Gallio is going to give, where he's going to acknowledge that Paul really is being successful at persuading people to believe in Jesus. But I'm going to back up. Okay, I'm going to back up. Acts 18:12. While Gallio was this governor of Achaia, the southern part of Greece, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul, and they brought him to the place of judgment. And in verse 13, they charged Paul in Galileo's presence 
with these remarks. This man is persuading the people as if to say he's being successful in his mission and trying to persuade people about Jesus because we're so upset that he's successful that we're trying to trump up charges in front of the governor, you know, Galileo, you know, you get this guy locked up or something and stop him preaching because he's successful in persuading these people about Jesus, right? Okay, so verse 13, Acts 18, verse 13. This man, the accusers charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. So that's the charge, the trumped up charge. You know, he's persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. But as Paul, this verse 14, that's going to get into this, right? Verse 14, going to get into this? Before Paul began to speak in his defense, Gallio spoke to the Jews. And you know what he's going to tell the Jews? I'm going to speak on Paul's behalf. I'm going to make a defense on his behalf. Who bear? Is the Greek word for on behalf of. And what does is, what is Gallio say to the Jews in verse 15? If you Jews had a complaint about a misdemeanor or some serious crime, It'd be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since your complaint involves questions about words, and questions about names, and questions about your own law, that these people, you know, you're trumping up charges against a guy that are false. Because it's not contrary to the law that he's persuading people to worship God. No. These are just disputes within the structure of your own biblical debate. Legitimate charge you're making to try to get me, the Roman governor, upset with this guy and use the power of, of government to go against Paul. No, this is, this is bull crap. This is essentially what Gallio was saying to the Jews, right? If you Jews, in verse 15, were making some complaint about a misdemeanor or some serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since your complaint involves questions about words and names and your own law, then I'm not going to be, you settle the matter yourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Settle the matter yourselves. I'm not going to be a judge of such things. So the old NIV says that the guy Gallio had the Jews ejected from the court. The newer version of the NIV says, so he drove them off. You know, like, get out of here, kind of thing. But then in verse 17, then the crowd that was there, they all turned on Sosthenes, apparently the new synagogue leader here, okay? Verse 17. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the crowd, and they started beating this guy Sosthenes in front of the governor. And what was Gallio's response? I don't care. The NIV says he showed no concern whatever. <laughs> and it struck me as funny when I read this that, that, this, that, that, this, that this guy who's supposed to be a governor to keep order in society as a guy being beaten up by a crowd right in front of me doesn't even care. <laughs> it just strikes me funny. But in verse 18, so Paul stayed, this is Acts 18, 18. So Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the Corinthian brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria accompanied by the tent maker couple, Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed for Syria, he had his hair cut off at a place called Sancria because of a vow or a promise to God under the law of Moses that he had made to God that he had to go through the ritual of getting his hair cut off. Okay, so the idea is before he sailed to Syria, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because of a vow he had taken. 
But go to verse 19. This is Acts 18. Go to verse 19. Paul and Silas and Timothy. No, 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 I'm going to correct myself. Acts 18, verse 19. It's not Paul and Silas and Timothy. Here, in verse 19, it is Paul and Priscilla and Aquila who arrive at a detour because they're they're going to or Paul's going to Syria and they're on the, the ship with him, but they're they're making a little detour stop to Ephesus. And I've been to Ephesus. So I mean I've been to Ephesus on the Aegean Sea and I, I, I have a picture of this, right? So Acts 18 verse 19. Then Paul and Priscilla and Aquila they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila so they would stay on in Ephesus. You know, just kind of make a trip over there and drop them off at, at Ephesus, right? But what Paul did is he seized this opportunity to just, well, let me let me just go and, and visit the synagogue in Ephesus. So Paul himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. This is in Ephesus, modern Turkey. So Paul, you know, he's dropping off Priscilla and Aquila at Ephesus. But, but he himself went into the synagogue there in Ephesus, and he's, and he's going into the synagogue reasoning with the Jews, but look at the Jews' response. They want Paul to spend more time with them. They want to know more. But Paul doesn't have time to just get into it more, so he declines their request to spend a longer amount of time there in Ephesus. He declined their request. But he did promise them, he did promise them as he left them, if it is God's will for me to come back to Ephesus on another trip to see you, then I'm going to come back and see you. Then Paul set sail from Ephesus and he landed at Caesarea. And Caesarea, in verse 22, is on the western coast of Israel. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea. And I've swum, if, it's, if that's grammatically correct. It's correct. Okay. I've swum. Okay. You swum, swum. I, I, I swum in the Mediterranean Sea at Caesarea. Really so I, I see the picture here of this location. But in, but in Acts 18, verse 22, when Paul landed at ashore at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem to greet the congregation there. And then he went down to Antioch, meaning that he had intended to sail to Syria, because remember it said a few verses ago he intended to sail to Syria? Well, he made it to Syria. Because Antioch is in Syria. Okay, so verse 22. This is Acts 18, verse 22. When Paul landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem to greet the congregation, which was to go a little south, you know, to get to the congregation in Jerusalem. But then he goes up north to get to Syria, and he goes to the city of Antioch in Syria. And that Antioch, Syria city that he returns to in Acts 18, verse 22, is the very city that he had started from with his second missionary trip. Because his second missionary trip had begun in Acts 15.36. Remember in Acts 15.36, he starts out his trip leaving Antioch. And then he starts his travels for the, you know, for the second missionary trip. Well, guess what? According to Acts 18, verse 22, getting back to Antioch means that he's returning to the city that he started his second journey from. Like he's completed and finished his second missionary trip by returning to Antioch. Okay? Now, do, now I just want to see if there's time to throw in verse 23. Because verse 23, this is Acts 18, verse 23, this begins the third missionary trip. Right? This begins the third missionary trip. But first in verse 23, you see it mentioned that he spends a little time in Antioch. Before he leaves Antioch again 
and travels throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, going from town to town in Galatia and town to town in Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples in all those towns. So this guy's busy. <laughs> But there is something in verse 24 that for me is worth mentioning. Even though it's just kind of a, a parenthesis in the text, because Paul isn't in Ephesus. Because he's, he's doing a third missionary trip going from town to town in Galatia and Phrygia, right? So, so it's like this is a parenthesis in the text. It's like all of a sudden we're gonna, we're gonna go to Ephesus. Paul isn't even in Ephesus, but we're going to all of a sudden go to Ephesus. In Acts 18, verse 24. But I want to go there myself. I want to go to 18, 24, because, because I'm very impressed with the guy that we're going to be introduced to in the text. His name is Apollos. So, Acts 18, 24. There's a man named Apollos who came to Ephesus. Apollos is a Jewish man. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt, a major city in the ancient world. Okay, so Acts 18.24. Apollos is a Jewish man who was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and he came to Ephesus, but he was a learned man, meaning that he was really well studied. He had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. And that means he had a thorough knowledge of Jesus' Bible. Because there was not a document called New Testament written at that time. So he had a thorough knowledge of the Jewish scriptures. And it says in verse 25 that he was a guy that was instructed in the way of the Lord. And, and, and the NIV says in the footnote, you can translate it, that he he's he, he spoke with, with, a, with a fervor in the spirit. Okay? So, Acts 18, 20. Five. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. He, thank you. Thank you, Mark. He was instructed. Acts 18, 25. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. And, and he spoke with fervor in the spirit. And he spoke about Jesus accurately, though he only knew about the baptism of John. In other words, John the Baptist. How is that possible? Yeah. Right. Is that through the Holy Spirit? He did not yet know about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He, in other words, he knew about the baptism of John. And he knew that the baptism of John was, as the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 talks about, you know, the baptism of John... You know, Mark chapter 1 talks about the, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then it begins to talk about the prophecy about John the Baptist. So he saw okay. Jesus in the Old Testament. Then. I'm sorry? He For saw sure. Jesus in the Old For Testament sure. and he believed that. Another question? Yes, he did. So that's how he knew. He did. He did. Yeah, absolutely. He absolutely did. He saw Jesus in the Jewish Scriptures. But he, but he only knew the baptism of John. And in Mark chapter 1, it explains that the baptism of John, meaning John the Baptist, the guy doing those water baptisms, it says in Mark chapter 1 that that was a, a baptism in Mark 1, 5. Remember that one? Mark 1, 5, where people were confessing their sins while they were getting baptized. They were confessing their sins, and, and John was baptizing them in the Jordan River. My baptism in the Jordan River was in 1960, but but in this one, you know, a couple years later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but 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 see that baptism of John is is a, according to like Acts 19. If we were to you know kind of like go ahead, like get ahead of ourselves and go to Acts 19, because we're not even you know in Acts 19 yet. But if we were to go ahead, Paul would be meeting some people in Ephesus in Acts 19, the first few verses, Paul gets to Ephesus himself. Go, you know, he's doing his missionary travel in Galatia and Phrygia, and he goes through the interior like the 
you know, not by sea but by land. He goes through the interior and he gets to Ephesus and he finds some disciples in Ephesus in Acts 19 too. You know, he asks them, did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you became a believer in the Messiah? And they said, no, we haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And then what happens is Paul ends up re-baptizing re them because they had been baptized John the Baptist baptism of repentance confessing your sins and all but now they get baptized by Paul into the name of the Lord Jesus like a, a messianic baptism because the baptism of John wasn't a messianic baptism right because messianic means it's new covenant it's like Jeremiah 31 baptism Jeremiah 31 31 baptism that God says there's a new covenant and involved in this new covenant is I don't remember sin anymore so you're not confessing your sin in a new covenant thing, but you were with John the Baptist. And so this is all that Apostle, um, this is all that Apollos knew was the baptism of John, right? But he believed in Jesus. He just didn't understand the new covenant yet, right? Okay. So if we go back to Apollos, okay? Meaning the resurrection? The resurrection as a transition to a brand new relationship with God that has nothing to do with sin, the new creation so identity. That, yeah. Is that what you're Apollo did not yet understand that, right? So there was just like Galatians 4, where they were still under like the tutor until they reached the age of, the, the age of like recognition. Is it that kind of a, a kind of a little It's a parallel. It's a total parallel. Total parallel. Okay? Total parallel. Okay? So so what I'm doing then is is I'm, I'm I'm looking at this this guy Apollos right, and and I'm um, I'm going to go back to verse 25. It's Acts 18:25, right? Okay, um, that that he was instructed about the way of the Lord, and, and he spoke with fervor in the Spirit, and he taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew about the baptism of John the Baptist. Okay, but but in the next verse, okay. Like verse uh, 26, Acts 18, 26. When Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue in Ephesus, remember the tent maker couple, Priscilla and Aquila? They were in the synagogue listening to Apollos speak boldly in the synagogue there, right? So, Acts 18, 26. Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue in Ephesus, and Priscilla and Aquila were in the synagogue listening to him. And so what they did was they invited him after the service. They invited him to their home. Yeah, 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 yeah. They invited them to, to their home so that they could teach Apollos the way of God more accurately. In other words, bring them up to date a little bit. <laughs> Revised edition. Right? Yeah, revised. <laughs> so they, they had jumped ahead of Paul. So this parenthesis, Paul is still back doing his thing, and now Apollos and yes. Priscilla and Aquila, who and were the with reason, him for a while, and now they jumped up ahead to Ephesus. Yes, because what happened is Priscilla and Aquila were already in Ephesus before Paul got there. Because remember, he left them off of the ship at Ephesus, and then he left to go to Syria. Gotcha. And then he left them behind in Ephesus. So they're there when Apollos comes to town as this new speaker in the synagogue. And and they, and he's bold. And, 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 and he's talking about Jesus. And he's got fervor in the spirit and everything. He's accurate about Jesus. But he, he, he's a little old covenant guy. You know. <laughs> so so they, they, they invite him after the service to their home. And they teach him the way of God more adequately. But 19 it says the three of them arrived in Ephesus. Then they stayed, and then he went back to Caesarea. Yeah, yeah. Am I getting this right? Or well, right? he he first he had before. See, see, the return to Antioch was way back in Acts eighteen twenty-two. That's when he returned to Antioch. I see. This is the third missionary trip. Well, that's where it starts. The third missionary trip starts at Acts eighteen verse twenty-three. Oh. Oh, okay. that, that, that's, that's where you get the introduction of the I third missionary. I said 19 once, so I was wrong. Gotcha. No problem. No problem. But, but, but just real quick, Acts 18, 27, okay? 
Acts 18, 27. Oh, oh, oh. I just, I'm just remembering part of what the verse says. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's coming back. This guy, Apollos, he's in Ephesus, but he wants to go to Achaia, that southern region of Greece. Okay, he's in Ephesus, modern Turkey, but he wants to go to that southern region of Greece called Achaia. And the disciples in Ephesus encourage him to go ahead and make the trip, and the disciples in Ephesus, they write a letter to the Corinthian brothers and sisters because Corinth is the major city in the southern region of Greece. So Achaia is almost like synonymous with Corinth, you know? So, so in Acts 18, 27, Apollos wants to go to Achaia, the southern <coughs> region of Greece, and so the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encourage him to go, and they write a letter to Achaia, the southern region of Greece, and they say, you know, we got a guy that we're sending to you, and when he arrives in Corinth, please welcome him. And on his arrival to Corinth, Apollos ends up being in verse 27, it's Acts 18, 27, right? On arriving in Corinth, Apollos is a great help to those people in Corinth who by grace were able to believe this message about Jesus being the Messiah. We could say in this part of the letter, it's your fault because you're about to leave your job. And we're this guy because we're about to leave our jobs and support the ministry. Amen. <laughs> uh, amen. It's true. This, this month. It's true, brother. It, uh, it really is true. You're, it's, down, you're down your way out. Amen. Amen. So in, in, in Acts 18, 27, this guy of policy gets to Corinth, the southern, you know, region of Greece. It's the major city there. He gets there, but he's a great help to the brothers and sisters in Corinth. Who? in the Corinth, you know, by grace, had come to believe in Jesus. But why was he a great help, Paulus? Why was he a great help, given what verse 28 goes on to say? He strengthened these people's faith in Jesus, and that was a great help to them, who by grace believed, but he strengthened their faith in Jesus through the fact of what it says in Acts 18, verse 28. How did he help them in a great way? How did he strengthen their faith in, in Jesus? Because in verse 28, Acts 18, 28, he vigorously refuted all those objections that the Jewish, had to, that the Jewish people had for don't believe in Jesus for this reason, that reason, and the next reason. Well, he's great help to these people in Corinth because he refuted all of these Jewish opposing thoughts as to reasons why he shouldn't believe in Jesus. Well, what, is it, what does it say in Acts 18, 28? For Apollos vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate. Nice. In public debate. So it encouraged these people. Man, this guy gets out there in public and, 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 and at the end of verse 28, he proves from the Scriptures. I mean, proves his case from the Jewish Scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. He uses knowledge. He used the knowledge because, remember, he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. And he's a, he's a great help to those in Corinth who by grace had believed because he vigorously shuts down all of that argumentation against why Jesus you know, should not be believed in. I mean, he vigorously refused the Jews, the, the opponents of the, of the message. In that case, they just happened to be Jewish, in this case. But because they were Jewish, in this case, then they saw that the scriptures that he was the, making the case from, the very Jewish scriptures, were in fact making the point accurately. This guy knew his scriptures, and they were not able to argue with him. They were not able to argue with him, but that strengthened the Corinthians' faith in Jesus because all this stuff that would create doubt just got alleviated because Apollos mm. knew the Jewish scriptures and he knew how to prove from the scriptures in public debate that Jesus is the Messiah. You can defend, you can defend the truth. Which is Philippians 1, 
when the Apostle Paul says about verse 7 that, that I'm defending and confirming the good news. Defending and confirming the good news. Which one? And what Peter says, what made this fear defending the gospel? Oh, first uh, Peter 3.15. And follow. Yes. Okay? Give, giving the apologia. Right. Giving the defense, you know. And my version says, uh, fierce arguments. Yours said what? Great refutation. Oh! Yours, when we reach hers. His, his, he got into fierce arguments with the Jewish people, and in public she used the scriptures to prove that Jesus is the... I would, I would give anything to have been there that period of time to hear that just from the Jewish scriptures. I just wanted to add, can you imagine if ministers today really knew their Old Testament like, like spiritually in the spirit, like they were enlightened, and just taught without having this part? Uh, it, it, would, it would greatly help those who by grace believe because it would give them the, the scriptural, yeah. just utterly like... Like foundation is exactly right, Kyle. You're right with foundation, because 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 it says that Apollos proved his point from the scriptures that the Jews were. You see, you see. Uh, that's amazing. First Corinthians three ten or eleven or whatever. Well, First Corinthians three ten and eleven is about the foundation. Yeah. The foundation of Jesus, the Messiah. That's from. Scriptures. That's from Jesus' scriptures, exactly. Just my old pals that I still love and I have friendships with, they just run right to Revelation 20 like to the end of the book and just say, Gate the fire. Exactly. <laughs> it's like they're just a because, whole Bible because, because nothing. Because they did not understand, you know, and it's like I didn't used to understand in my old days yeah, either. That's what's keeping them from sinning while they still sin. Uh, uh, that's funny. That's funny. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, and, and see, and see, and see, what's so interesting to me is that at this time in the book of Acts, nobody ever brought up a lake of fire. Because there was no thought of Revelation chapter 20, since Revelation as a whole book wasn't written at the time. 300 years. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, and then, yeah. so it's, it's many, many decades yeah. earlier than, than the composition of the book of Revelation. Well, right. death law so, is a statement, so does punishment, because punishment produces death, and death produces punishment. It does. And that old covenant thing that had to do with punishment is over because death is the end of punishment in the Jewish scriptures death is the end of punishment so the fact that you've got the Messiah that died on behalf of everyone that ever violated the law then now it's a new creation identity on the side of resurrection associated with Jesus who perfectly obeyed the law so there is no punishment in relationship to the new covenant that Jesus is the mediator of because remember Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, says Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Now that he's died as a ransom to pay off the sins committed under the first covenant. And as a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Scott Waldron said the other day, <laughs> Amen. He said, in reference to Hebrews 9, 15, he died as a ransom to pay off the sins committed under the first covenant. That was the only covenant that charged sin to anybody's account. The covenant with Abraham had nothing to do with sin. That was 430 years before the Ten Commandments. The new covenant has nothing to do with sin because in Jeremiah 31, 34, God says, I don't even remember sin. In other words, the only covenant that had anything to do with sin was the law of Moses that legislated morality, and if you don't live up to a standard, you get a death penalty. Forever. In other words, the, you know, Hebrews 9.15, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant now that he's died as a ransom to set the people free from the only covenant that had anything to do with sin. And now that Jesus died, then he died on behalf of everybody that violated the law. 
So the law doesn't convict a dead person of being guilty. So as far as the law is concerned, the law sees a corpse and says, you're innocent. Because, because in Galatians 2.19, we borrow, Galatians 2.19, that through law, Paul says, through law, I died. Now, Paul was physically living when he wrote that verse. But legally speaking, in the eyes of the law, when Jesus died on the cross, it was Paul that died. He says in Galatians 2.19, for through law, I have died. And was he an unbeliever at the time that Jesus died? Yes. But did he have to be a believer to be penalized by the law's jurisdiction? You're under my authority. You sinned. Can you be put to death even if you're not a believer? Does the law allow for your execution even if you're not a believer? Yes. Because Paul wasn't a believer at the time Jesus died. And he says in Galatians 2.19, For through law I died. And that ended my relationship to that covenant of law. In order that on the side of resurrection I would live to God. I'd live in a relationship with God. Like Galatians 4.6 describes the new covenant relationship. In Galatians 4.6, God sends the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit sent into our hearts to cry, Abba. And I heard an Israeli boy say to his father, Abba. And it just has impressed me for all the years since I've heard that Israeli boy say to his father, Abba. Meaning, Daddy. Lord Jesus, here we are. Here we are. We, we, we snuck in a little bit of Ephesus Amen. with Apollos. And Paul, next week, will arrive at Ephesus himself. And he's going to ask these disciples that he met in Ephesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed in Jesus the Messiah? And they're going to say, no, we haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. There's something, Father God, about being taught about the spiritual baptism that is the new covenant baptism. So thank you, Lord, that we're understanding a measure of your grace. But here's a request I make, Father. In Jesus' name, I lift up my hands publicly, making this request to you, Lord God. Jesus, let me take Apollos' example and talk to a group of scholars in a public forum with an audience present. A group of scholars that are willing to use the scriptures of Apollos' Bible on this issue of a trans transition from the baptism of John, which is about repentance and confessing your sins, to the new covenant baptism of the Spirit. Let it be, Father God, that you would give me an opportunity, like you gave Apollos an opportunity, to have a public audience so that I could, I pray, be a great help to people who by grace have believed in Jesus that this grace covenant that is in relationship to everybody that was under the law of Moses, which is ultimately everyone, that's why it has become famous in the so-called evangelical church to say in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. Romans 5.13 The only way you charge sin to somebody's account is if they're under law. All sin. Jews, non-Jews, everybody in the world, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But in Romans 3.24 the continuation of the sentence says being declared not guilty freely by His grace through the redemption that's based on the principle of law. Something was done by the high priest on your behalf. You couldn't do it on your own. If you tried to be the high priest for yourself, you'd die. Because God wouldn't have it. The high priest is appointed on your behalf. He does the atoning work 
for you. That's why everybody's dying. They're trying to be the high priest. And everybody's dying because they're trying to be. I agree. I agree, Ron, that everybody's dying because they're trying to be the high priest. I agree with that. So, Jesus, my prayer is that you would open that door for public debate or dialogue or discussion with scholars that would have the respect for the book of Acts. A book that throughout the book from the beginning to the end is all about the Jewish scriptures yes. being the Bible of the day. So that there would be a group of scholars that would say, let's look at this doctrine of hell and see if there is one verse, even one verse in those scriptures, even one verse that supports such a doctrine of hell. And let it be public. And let it be shown, even by the admission of the scholars. Well, we, we've always known that it wasn't in the quote-unquote Old Testament. Well, then the case has been made that Apollos has just proven from the scriptures a point concerning the character of Jesus the Messiah. That Jesus upholds the law. When Gallio, the governor of southern Greece, Achaia, said to the Jews, this guy isn't guilty of what you're accusing him of. You just have a, a dispute within your own Jewish religion about the meaning of of words and names and, and issues about your own interpretation within your own religion. So this guy's not some foreigner. This guy is just seeing in Scripture things that you other Jews are not seeing. And that's why it's by grace yes. that they believed in Corinth because it takes your grace, God, to open our eyes yeah. and to open up our minds so we can understand the Scriptures. But I pray that you take a group of scholars, Lord, and you present an opportunity for me to talk to them publicly and have it be a group of scholars that respect the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, there's one scriptural text. And it's the one text that Apollos proved his point from called the Scriptures. Those, those books that were in Jesus' Bible. That's so not. We sort of create for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. Yes. Put it as to sin. Yes. To talk for iniquity. To yes. bring the everlasting righteousness. To seal forth the vision of the prophet and to mark the most holy place. Amen. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The resurrection of the Messiah is the proof. That Daniel 9 24, just read by Larry, has been fulfilled. It is finished. The sin issue is over what forever. Is Jesus it's oh, it's Jesus from the cross. John 19 30 says it's finished. Meaning, I'm well, the one that fulfilled the, the ministry. The I fulfilled the ministry of Daniel 9 24. I'm the Messiah who got rid of sin once and for all, who finished the transgression, put an end to sin. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the Messiah. Lord Jesus, thank you for the congregation here in Lake Worth, Florida. Because Lord Jesus, you're teaching us. As, as our brother Chaz, who is here tonight, reminds me, we're being taught by the creator of the universe. Amen. We're being taught by the spirit of the truth to guide us into all the truth, John 16, 13. Why do we need the spirit to guide us in the text? And all the truth. Because you, according to 1 Corinthians again, that letter of 1 Corinthians again, you tell us, Lord, through the Apostle Paul, that only, in 1 Corinthians 2.11, you say, only a person's own spirit within them know their own thoughts. Only the Spirit of God knows God's own thoughts. Only the Spirit of God knows how to interpret what the Father means by this statement or that statement. And yet you've given us the Spirit to search all Amen. things, you, even the deep things of God. Back to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. So thank you, Jesus, that you are strengthening us so that we are getting stronger in our faith 
in Jesus because we have Jesus' Bible as attesting to the legitimacy of His claim to be the divine Son of God by raising Himself from the dead people as the Scriptures said that He would come back to life on the third day after the Messiah was put to death. Well, Jesus, thank You for revealing Yourself to us so that we, according to Philippians 3.10, may continue with this quest to know the anointed King and to know the power of Your resurrection, Jesus, because the New Covenant is in the power of Your resurrection. Yes. In other words, Jesus, there's no sin issue anymore. That belonged to the baptism of John, confessing your sins in Mark 1.5 while you were getting baptized. That belonged to the old system of government, which couldn't stop the power of the sin guy. Instead, in 1 Corinthians 15.56, the sin guy received power by the imposition of the law as a demand and an obligation on people that in the limitations of their human nature had no chance of keeping it. Mm, but there's a new system, Lord. And it's alluded to in Romans 6.14. That the sin principle is not boss over us. Is not lording over us. Is not master over us. Because we're not under law. So you can't accuse us law. You can't condemn us law. You can't make us feel like our human conscience would want to feel about ourselves, Like we haven't lived up to a standard. Lord Jesus, you died on the cross on behalf of everybody that ever violated the law. And as far as the law is concerned, we have died under its penalty and we are no longer subject to its rules. But we're governed by the Spirit. Yes, Lord, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Galatians 5.1 It's upon the basis of freedom that the anointed high priest liberated us. And he encourages us, Paul does, stand firm. And don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Rather, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, and following, Jesus, you say to us, come to me. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. Learn of me from humble and gentle in heart. And by coming to me and learning of me, you'll find rest for your souls. Jeremiah 6.16 When you come to the crossroads and you wonder, do I go this way or do I go that way? Ask for the ancient path Amen. where the good way is yes. and follow that established path. That's why it's in the foundation of the Jewish Scriptures that we have to be rooted and established if we're going to be strong and encouraged and built up that the living God is for us and not against us. There's no doctrine of hell in the Jewish scriptures. So all those years that I was tormented by fear of going to hell was completely deception. Brought you to Jesus. But it did bring me to the realization that I had no righteousness and that's a good thing because now I'm understanding Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 that the Lord is our righteousness. Yes, Lord, thank, you, Father. thank you, Lord Jesus, for helping us and encouraging our hearts to understand that you are the God who is on our behalf. So, God, I'm just going to say it as sort of a benediction. I'm going to say Romans 8 31 and following. The God is on our behalf. Therefore, nobody can be against us. Even if they try, they won't be able to attack and harm Paul because Jesus has many team members in the city of Corinth. But directly, Jesus, you are on our behalf. And we can't even defeat ourselves. Because every time I tried to defeat myself and be my own worst enemy and try to sabotage myself, what did you do? You only received, revealed your grace to me in a greater way and made, you, made me love you more because of being merciful to me to a greater degree. It's a win-win. The good news is a win-win. Yes. And as one brother says, Pastor Gary, that we would love to be able to contact again, Pastor Gary says, there's no bad news in the good news. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know one modern scholar talked about the fangs of the gospel. And he put that in print. The fangs of the gospel. You know? As if the gospel was like the snake. But no, the snake didn't want us to see the light of the good news of the glory of the anointed king who is the image of God who loves us as Jesus loves his own body so he loves us as his own human self. Father God, I pray that you would encourage our heart as we are knit together in love so that we may have the full riches of complete understanding that we would grasp the height and the depth and the width and the length of the love of the anointed King, that you, Jesus, are good. And because you are good and your covenant love endures forever, we praise you. The new, new covenant, days are surely coming, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. A covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. In those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, I will write on their hearts, I will be their God. They shall be my people, no longer shall teach one another. Say to another, know the Lord, for I shall be they will all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. That prophecy that Larry just read from Jeremiah 31. 31. <laughs> The 34. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Amen, Amen to that. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, yes Lord Jesus. That is the truth. And Jesus, you said in John 8, 31 and following that we're really your students, your disciples could be translated students. We're really your students when we're in your teaching. And as a result, we know the truth and the truth makes us free. Yeah, like makes. Like yeah, makes us free, like the King James would say. Yes, Jesus, you are our liberator, our defender. But you're not only our liberator and defender, but as 1 John 2, 2 would say, you are the atoning sacrifice for the whole world. Thank you, Father God. I pray according to the riches of your glory that you would strengthen us with the power of the Spirit and that you would encourage our heart, Lord Jesus, that we are just beginning to understand your goodness. We're just getting a glimpse, Father God, of the new covenant. We're just beginners. But thank you, Jesus, that we're on the path of life, which is a new covenant path. Because, Lord, that misery under that old mindset, so it was bad. S U C K S. Sorry. It's okay. I'm just affirming it. Sorry. I'm just affirming it. That's actually mild. Paul called it poo poo in Philippians 3. Yeah, he did. The Greek word. Often translated dung. But anyway, Lord, I want to thank you. Because your word is alive and working sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing the divide between soul and spirit, revealing what's our own perception and comparing that to your thoughts that your spirit reveals to us, which is your perception. How do we feel about ourselves soulishly? It's not quite the same as how God feels about us. Amen. Since in Isaiah 40, excuse me, Isaiah 55, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And your ways are not my ways. For as the high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. But I thank you that your thoughts are totally for us all the time. All the time. 100% of the time. Because you identify us with the behavior of Jesus all the time. And you identified all of our behavior on the cross once for all. Once and for all the time. 
at the end of the ages, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Father, I'm just going to say it. Thank you for everybody here. I just pray you bless our fellowship, Father God. Encourage our hearts as we're knit together in your love. Keep revealing to us the height and depth, width and length of your love in Jesus' name. Amen. You know